the second broadcast of the hour of the time. Welcome back, friends, and for those of you who are just catching us for the first time tonight, we're here with a message, and we're going to be here as long as we can. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Central, SpaceNet 2, Channel 7, 7.5 audio. And the message is, wake up. The world is not as you perceive it. Powerful forces manipulate vast populations. For certain benefits to them, as well as for the completion of what they call the great work. Others call it the New World Order. Others call it a one-world government. It requires the dissolution of the sovereignty of all individual nation-states, including the United States of America. It requires that we give up our Bill of Rights and that there be a redistribution of wealth. And the American people, in any kind of a reorder of civilization on that magnitude, will certainly suffer more than any other people's, for we will have to give up the most. Last night, we broadcast in its entirety the Constitution of the United States of America and the Articles in Amendment thereof as a gift from our Founding Fathers and from the hour of the time and from Stan and Elma and myself and Annie and Little Pooh to the American people who don't have a copy. You're not going to understand this broadcast unless you have a copy of the Constitution. For those of you who missed last night's broadcast, call Stan Barrington at area code 602-567-6109 or write to Stan at post office box 889, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322 and ask him to send you a list of available videotapes, audio tapes, my book, and any other material that you might have an interest in. This broadcast is paid for by me, nobody else. I don't belong to any organizations. I don't owe anything to anyone. I don't have any millionaire looking over my shoulder. We barely scrape to pay the rent and put the food on the table. And that's all we need. And as long as we can do that, we'll continue. I've been traveling across this country for years now, trying to wake up the American people. Everyone in this country knows that there is something wrong. They can feel it in their gut. But they can't put their finger on it. They can't identify it. They don't know what it is. They don't understand how a trusting people can be so easily subverted and manipulated. Our country is in the process of being destroyed. Not from a great enemy from without. Not from the evil empire. Not from Saddam Hussein. It's coming from within, folks. From within. We are being destroyed by our own apathy, the abdication of our power as a people. Remember, of, for, and by the people. You can't have of, for, and by the people if the people don't participate. It's impossible. It cannot be done. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Across America, I would like to hear that phrase everywhere. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. My message is going to be broadcast to you as long as we can keep this satellite time. I would like to tell you my creed, ladies and gentlemen, so that you know a little bit about where I come from. I believe first in God, the same God in which my ancestors believed. 
I believe in Jesus Christ and that he is my Savior. But this is not a religious program, and I'm not going to preach to anyone. Second, I believe in the Constitution of the Republic of the United States of America, without interpretation, as it was written and meant to work by our forefathers. I have given my sacred oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I fully intend to fulfill that oath. Third, friends, I believe in the family unit, and in particular, my family unit. I have sworn that I will give my life, if it is required, in defense of God, the Constitution, or my family. Fourth, I believe that any man or woman, without principles, that he or she is ready and willing to die for, at any given moment, is already dead and is of no use or consequence whatsoever to themselves or to anyone else. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that at the end of World War II, a lot of things happened. An awful lot of things. A great ally became a great enemy, and a Cold War began. A Cold War that was perpetrated not from the peoples of those nations, but from the top, from the leadership of the nations. Understand that at the end of World War II, Harry Truman signed the United Nations Treaty and the United Nations Participation Act, which pledged that all nations would come together under the United Nations in a one-world government. And secretly it was agreed that the United States and the Soviet Union would provide the military forces for what would become the world police force. In light of recent history, I can see through the mist some of you shaking your heads out there. Bill's lost it. No, Bill hasn't lost it. Back in the 60s, the State Department published a little booklet called State Department Publication 7277. That document outlined everything that I just told you. It seems, ladies and gentlemen, and I verified this myself when I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence, Back between 1970 and 1973, I saw the documents outlining the plan for the New World Order. It was called Operation Majority. And in these documents, it said the same thing that State Department Publication 7277 outlined, and that the headlines of newspapers in 1945, 1946 outlined when the UN Treaty was passed. The same thing happened when they created the Disarmament Agency for the ultimate purpose of disarming all peoples and all nations. The newspapers again outlined in their headlines the plan for world peace under the United Nations. Why do you think now that the New World Order has been brought out into the open that there's such a push that take the guns away from the American people. The guns. The only thing that really keeps us totally free from oppression, from an outside enemy, or from within, from our own government, should it become oppressive. There is a joint resolution, H.J. 438, which was introduced March 11th, 1992, in Congress right now. What that bill was introduced for was to repeal the second article and amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America, the right of the people to keep and bear arms. You see, because there was an agreement made long ago that the only way to get the monies from the people of the nations to build, equip, 
train and finance the one world police force was to create a phony war, a cold war, so that the people in their fear would dig in their pockets and pay the tax dollars that were needed, so that they could create the technology and the weaponry and train the people who would ultimately be transferred to the umbrella of the United Nations and function as the only armed force in the world. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, that that is what is happening. And that was one reason for the Iraq War, but that's another program. Tonight I want to lay the groundwork which will let you understand some of this. In 1952, a secret world body was formed, and it came directly from the Royal Institute of International Affairs in England commonly known in England as Chatham House. Chatham House is the private club for British intelligence. Chatham House, our Royal Institute of International Affairs, is also the organization in England which helped to form the Council on Foreign Relations in this country. And then later the Council on Foreign Relations split off and formed the Trilateral Commission. But they are all the same group, ladies and gentlemen. At the highest level, they're all members of the same club. And I mean at the highest level of all nations in the world. Those who refuse to play are deposed. And that's what really happened to Marcos and the Shah of Iran and Margaret Thatcher. And Margaret Thatcher is now trying to warn the world. She failed in Great Britain. Don't give up your sovereignty to the New World Order. This group that was formed internationally was called the Bilderberg Group because the first publicly known meeting was at the Bilderberg Hotel in Europe. And there they approved the concept of the destruction of the sovereignty of this nation. And they published a technical manual, Operations Research Technical Manual TM-SW7905.1, which is published in its entirety as Chapter 1 in my book, Behold a Pale Horse. But tonight I'm going to give you just a little bit of it, just a taste so that you'll begin to know, so that you'll begin to understand why you have this feeling in your gut that something is wrong. Silent weapon technology has evolved from operations research, which is a strategic and tactical methodology developed under the military management. Eisenhower. In England during World War II, the original purpose of operations research was to study the strategic and tactical problems of air and land defense with the objective of effective use of limited military resources against foreign enemies. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, logistics. It was soon recognized by those in positions of power, which was the Council on Foreign Relations, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, that the same methods might be useful to totally controlling a society, but better tools were necessary. Social engineering, which is the analysis and automation of a society, requires the correlation of great amounts of constantly changing economic information. Data, in other words. So a high-speed computerized data processing system was necessary which could race ahead of the society and predict when society would arrive for capitulation. That means surrender. Relay computers were too slow, but the electronic computer invented in 1946 by J. Presper Eckert and John W. Mouchley filled the bill. The next breakthrough was the development of the simplex method of linear programming in 1947 by the mathematician George B. Danzig. Then, in 1948, 
the transistor, invented by J. Bardeen, W. H. Bretain, and W. Shockley, promised great expansion of the computer field by reducing space and power requirements. With these three inventions under their direction, those in positions of power strongly suspected that it was possible for them to control the whole world with a push of a button. Immediately, the Rockefeller Foundation got in on the ground floor by making a four-year grant to Harvard College, funding what was called the Harvard Economic Research Project for the study of the structure of the American economy. One year later, in 1949, of all things, the United States Air Force joined in. I might mention here, have you seen their new uniforms lately? They have no insignia on those uniforms anywhere with the initials U.S. or with the words United States. And if you look at them real closely, you will see that they are United Nations uniforms. Back to this document. In 1952, the original grant period terminated in a high-level meeting of the elite, the Illuminati as they call them, the shadow government of the world, personified to the public eye as the Bilderberg Group, was held to determine the next phase of social operations research. The Harvard Project had been very fruitful, as is borne out by the publication of some of its results in 1953, suggesting the feasibility of economic or social engineering. The name of the The result was Studies in the Structure of the American Economy, copyright 1953, by Wassily Leontief, International Sciences Press, Incorporated, printed in White Plains, New York. Engineered in the last half of the decade of the 1940s, the new quiet war machine stood, so to speak, in sparkling gold-plated hardware on the showroom floor by 1954. With the creation of the Maser in 1954, the promise of unlocking unlimited sources of fusion atomic energy from the heavy hydrogen in seawater, and the consequent availability of unlimited social power, was a possibility considered only decades away. The combination, of course, to the powerful elite, the shadow government, the real rulers of the world, the filthy rich, was irresistible. The quiet war was quietly declared by the international elite in the personification of the Bilderberg Group at a meeting held in 1954. Although the silent weapons system was nearly exposed 13 years later, the evolution of the new weapons system has never suffered any major setbacks. This volume that I'm reading from marks the 25th anniversary of the beginning of the quiet war. Already this domestic war has had many victories on many fronts throughout the world. In 1954 it was well recognized by those in positions of authority that it was only a matter of time, only a few decades before the general public would be able to grasp and upset the cradle of power for the very elements of the new silent weapon technology were as accessible for a public utopia as they were for providing a private utopia. Ah, but the public didn't see it. The issue of primary concern, ladies and gentlemen, was that of dominance, and it revolved around the subject of the energy sciences. You see, there are only a few methods of control of people primary one, of course, is money. Secondary and very powerful, almost as powerful as money, is energy. In fact, it is said in some circles that he who controls energy controls money. The next is food, and the fourth and final one is fear. So there are four primary methods of control in the world. Money, energy, food, and fear. Energy is recognized 
as the key to all activity on this earth. Natural science is the study of the sources and control of natural energy, and social science, theoretically expressed as economics, is the study of the source and control of social energy. And that's why nobody understands economics. They don't want you to understand it. They don't want you to understand mathematics either, because both are bookkeeping systems, mathematics. Therefore, mathematics is the primary energy science, and the bookkeeper can be king if the public can be kept ignorant of the methodology of the bookkeeping. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. All science, ladies and gentlemen, is merely a means to an end. The means is knowledge, the end is control. To these people, the end always justifies the means. Beyond this remains only one issue. Who, who will be the beneficiary? In 1954, this was the issue of primary concern. Although the so-called moral issues were raised, in view of the law of natural selection, it was agreed, and listen closely, it was agreed that a nation or world of people who will not use their intelligence are no better than animals who do not have intelligence. Such people are beasts of burden and stakes on the table by choice and consent. Consequently, in the interest of future world order, peace, and tranquility. It was decided to privately wage a quiet war against the American public with an ultimate objective of permanently shifting the natural and social energy, which is wealth, of the undisciplined and irresponsible many, which is you, into the hands of the self-disciplined, responsible, and worthy few, which is them. In order to implement this objective, it was necessary to create, secure, and apply new weapons, which, as it turned out, were a class of weapons so subtle and sophisticated in their principle of operation and public appearance as to earn for themselves the name Silent Weapons. In conclusion, the objective of economic research, as conducted by the magnates of capital, which is banking, and the industries of commodities, which is goods and services, is the establishment of an economy which is totally predictable and manipulatable. I almost uh, didn't get that pronounced right. In order to achieve a totally predictable economy, the low-class elements of the society must be brought under total control. In effect, must be housebroken, trained, and assigned a yoke in long-term social duties from a very early age before they have an opportunity to question the propriety of the manner. In order to achieve such conformity, the lower class family unit must be disintegrated by a process of increasing preoccupation of the parents and the establishment of government-operated daycare centers for the occupationally orphaned children. The quality of education given to the lower class must be of the poorest sort, so that the moat of ignorance isolating the inferior class from the superior class is and remains incomprehensible to the inferior class. With such an initial handicap, listen closely, even bright lower class individuals have little if any hope of extricating themselves from their assigned lot in life. This form of slavery is essential to maintaining some measures of social order, peace, and tranquility for the ruling upper class. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, that this does not say for the world, not for the peace and tranquility, our social order of the world. It's for the ruling upper class. Everything that is expected from an ordinary weapon is expected from a silent weapon by its creators, but only in its own manner of functioning. It shoots situations instead of bullets, 
propelled by data processing instead of a chemical reaction, which is an explosion. Originating from bits of data instead of grains of gunpowder, from a computer instead of a gun, operated by a computer programmer instead of a gunner or a marksman, under the orders of a banking magnate instead of a military general. It makes no obvious explosive noises, causes no obvious physical or mental injuries, and does not obviously interfere with anyone's daily social life. Yet it makes an unmistakable noise, causes unmistakable physical and mental damage, and unmistakably interferes with daily social life, in effect unmistakable to a trained observer, one who knows what to look for. The public cannot comprehend this weapon, and therefore cannot believe that they are being attacked and subdued by a weapon. The public might instinctively feel that something is wrong. Isn't that the truth? Remember, this was written in 1954. But because of the technical nature of the silent weapon, they cannot express their feeling in a rational way or handle the problem with intelligence. Therefore, they do not know how to cry for help and do not know how to associate with others to defend themselves against it. When a silent weapon is applied gradually, the public adjusts or adapts to its presence and learns to tolerate its encroachment on their lives until the pressure, psychological via economic, becomes too great and they crack up. Therefore, the silent weapon is a type of biological warfare. It attacks the vitality, options, and mobility of the individuals of a society by knowing, understanding, manipulating, and attacking their sources of natural and social energy and their physical, mental, and emotional strengths and weaknesses. That's as far as I'm going to pursue that this evening. But I just know that there's a lot of people out there who don't believe that they can be manipulated. Who don't understand how easy that is. Who don't want to even consider that it could be a possibility. If you listen to this show every time it's broadcast, your entire, and I mean complete, an entire concept of reality is going to be ripped asunder. You are living in fantasy land, and you don't even know it. The park is closing. Your e-ticket has expired. And you're going to have to walk out there on Anaheim Boulevard And you're going to have to take a good, hard look at the real world. So let's start right now. Let me give you a few examples of how the public is manipulated on a regular basis. Number one, I'll bet that most of you really support the environmental cause. Those that don't are still sympathetic to parts of it. For instance, I don't believe I know anyone, no matter how hardcore conservative or how, how uh, totally left-wing liberal they are. It doesn't make any difference. They all seem to have a pang of conscience when it comes to burning the rainforests in the Amazon jungle. So they cry for control. Half the world is up in arms to stop the burning of the rainforest in Brazil, in the Amazon jungle. Now those trees, those forests, belong to the nation of Brazil. Brazil, according to the traditional law of the world, is a sovereign nation answerable only to itself and to no one else. But half the world is screaming for control. Stop burning the rainforest. Stop Brazil. 
Do whatever you have to do, but make them stop burning the rainforest. You hear it all the time. You see programs all over the public education channels, the Discovery Channel. You read about it in books and magazines all the time. It's a subject of conversation on almost everybody's lips at one time or another. But have you ever stopped to consider that maybe somebody wants you to do that? Have you ever stopped to consider that maybe the whole thing was brought about to make you yell for control? Because, folks, i got to tell you, there's only one way to stop Brazil from burning her own rainforests. And that is destroy the sovereignty of nations, which includes the United States. Create an all-powerful organization that has authority over everything in the world such as the United Nations. Really doesn't matter what you call it, because that's the only way you can do it. Of course, you'd have to disarm Brazil, because Brazil would not take kindly to someone sending a police force down there to force them to stop burning the forest. And that's what this is all about. In fact, that is what is most of what you see on the news and hear is all about. There are manipulations to make you, the ignorant public, yell, scream, beg for more control. Every time you give somebody or something control, you lose freedoms and you lose rights. It's always happened that way. It will always happen that way in the future. The truth of the Amazon jungle is that the World Bank and the Inter International Monetary Fund built a highway across the Amazon jungle going nowhere. Four-lane highway going nowhere. Nowhere. Do you understand? There was no reason to build this highway did not pass through any cities or towns and did not connect any cities or towns with any other cities or towns. It was built because these people, the powerful elite, the men who make these decisions that manipulate the world, they knew that most of the people in Brazil are some of the poorest people in the entire world. And they have large families, as most poor people do. They're so poor in Brazil that Americans cannot even comprehend that kind of poverty. They're so poor that little children are murdered on the streets by thugs hired by businessmen because the children are nuisances. Murdered. Like squashing cockroaches. These men, the powerful men who rule the world, the Illuminati I call them, they knew that those poor people in Brazil would see that four-lane highway as the road to heaven, Valhalla, paradise. And that's exactly what happened. They set out in unimaginable droves down that highway. They each head of the family, our family, if the family went along, found a plot of land, quickly cleared it, burned the wood, if they couldn't sell it fast enough, and planted crops. Why? To feed their family for the promise of a better life. They didn't do anything that any one of you would not have done in the same situation. So I don't want to hear any, any of the hypocritical BS that comes from most people about these things. The soil is poor, and only one crop, if they're really lucky, two will grow in that soil. And then they have to move on and clear another patch, chop down the trees, and if they can't get rid of the wood by selling it, they burn it. But it doesn't make any difference because the vegetation is cleared and the trees are chopped down, and the animal life and the insect life have no place to live. So vast numbers of species are disappearing from the earth. 
and huge acreages are disappearing to the torch and to the woodcutters every minute, every hour, and every day. And the people of the world are screaming, stop, stop this madness. We must have the rainforest. In the species that are being rendered extinct, there may be cures for cancer, cures for AIDS, medicines for as yet unknown diseases. Who knows? And enough people are crying for control now to make it a big political issue. Big. Big bucks are involved in this. It's being fed by the people who always feed these things. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You're never going to stop the burning of that rainforest until you learn how to feed, clothe, and give those people jobs so that they can take care of themselves without burning the rainforest. We have to do something about huge, poor populations, birth control. We have to look to the future. Because even a new world order, a one world government, even if we gave them the power to go down there and stop it, they couldn't do it unless they killed all those people. Is that what you want? You want mass murder of populations and ethnic groups? To save the trees? The problem is deeper than that. The problem is the human population. The problem is third world countries with large populations of poor people and no industry. The problem is countries like the United States of America consuming 50% of the world's supply of energy and raw materials, but only having less than 5% of the world's population. A lot of people will argue with that. Rush Limbaugh, the man with half his brain tied behind his back, says there's no population problem. Why, we could take every man, woman, and child in the world, all the billions of them, and put them all in the state of Oregon, and they would each have one half of a city lot to live on. Well, I haven't figured that out, and I don't know if that's true or not. And until I figure it out, I wouldn't accept it, and I advise you not to either. But you see, that's not the problem. The problem is not where to put these people, but how to feed them how to clothe them, how to give them jobs. The problem is that they're going to have more children. The problem is that the increase in the population, the human population on this earth, and this is just one of the problems, by the way, is an exponential increase. Between 1957 and 1990, the population of the world, the human population, doubled. Since it's an exponential increasing, the next doubling should take place right around the year 2018, at which time we will need twice as much gasoline, twice as much oil, twice as many highways, twice as many cars, twice as much food, twice as many jobs, twice as many barber shops, twice as much meat, twice as much cotton for clothing. You get the picture? We're going to put twice as much pollution into the air, into the water, and into the ground. We're going to have a problem of disposing of twice as much nuclear waste material and toxic chemicals. What are you going to do with them? We're going to be producing twice as much effluent sewage in a world that can't deal with it already. We're going to need twice as much fish in an ocean where the fish are already poisonous and can't be consumed, and the shellfish are poisoned and can't be consumed. And even if they could, the populations of the marine animals are dwindling and disappearing at rapid rate. 
Going to need twice as many trees in the year 2018, and you're already screaming about trees now. Are you beginning to understand? You see, it's not where to put these people. And this proves that Rush Limbaugh really does have half his brain tied behind his back. This is the only show, this is the only radio, where you're really going to hear what's really happening. I would advise you to clue your friends and neighbors into it. Tell your local radio station they can rebroadcast these shows for nothing. I don't want anything from them, period. They don't even have to ask my permission. I recommend that you record these programs, these broadcasts, make copies of the tapes and give them to your friends and neighbors. If you'd like to order tapes from us because you don't have the facilities to record yourself, you may do so. Call Stan Barrington at area code 602-567-6109. Or write to me, William Cooper, Post Office Box 3299, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. That's Post Office Box 3299, Camp Verde, Arizona, 86322. And request a list of available material, books, videotapes, audio tapes, and the prices. Ladies and gentlemen, I've enjoyed the last 46, 47 minutes, and I'm going to enjoy tomorrow night's show, because finally, after years of trying, we're on the radio, and we're not on somebody else's show where they can cut us off or where they can limit the time are where they can ridicule and uh, debunk and deny because we had the heart to pursue it we have it and now you can listen you see the major media includes radio print and television in this country are all owned and controlled by five corporations all owned and controlled by members of the Council on Foreign Relations. And they are the people who are bringing all of this about. Or at least, let's say, they are part of the people in the United States who are bringing it about. They're not all of them, by a long shot. It takes a lot of people to do this. But I will tell you this, folks. Keep listening, keep tuning in, and understand what you're going to learn here is that it's not the Jews, it's not the Catholics, it's not the blacks, it's not the Chinese, it's not the Russians that you have to be afraid of. Yes, some members of this secret government, this secret cabal, are Jews, but most Jews don't know any more about this than you do. Some members of the cabal are Catholics, or at least they pretend to be. But most Catholics don't know any more about this than you do. Some of these people may even be black. I doubt it very seriously. And I can guarantee you that blacks don't know anything about this. The Chinese don't either. The men who are bringing these things about in the world today, who are organizing and bringing to completion the great work, the New World Order, are the latest in the descendants of a long line that stem from the ancient mystery schools, from the Temple of Wisdom in ancient Cairo, from the ancient religions of Babylon. And this has nothing to do with the Bible. I'm not preaching to you, and this is not church. I'm telling you what my research has discovered. 
These men belong to secret societies with a pyramidal structure of organization with a whole bunch of slathering idiots down at the bottom thirsting for the secrets or joining to get favors in their business dealings or in their legal court proceedings. And just a very few at the top who really know what's going on, controlling everybody below. And they're sworn to secrecy and sworn to favoritism of each other. And one told his son one day, who was a close friend of mine, when his son asked him why they were persecuting a family friend who was not a member of this secret society. And his father told him, If you are not one of us, you are nothing. Understand, that's what he told his son. Quote, If you are not one of us, you are nothing. And we will go into great detail as to who these people are. And it's not just one organization. They are all the same if they have a pyramidal organization of membership with degrees of initiation. They usually call themselves fraternal organizations. Oh, but oh no. They worship the intellect. They have no God. They may appear to worship in your local church or synagogue or cathedral. But that's just for the public show. That's so that they can hold office. That's so that they can do business in your town. But this is their real philosophy, and don't take it literally because they don't. They believe that man was held prisoner in the Garden of Eden by an unjust and vindictive, terrible God. And that Lucifer, through his agent Satan, set man free with the gift of intellect. Free from the bonds of ignorance in the Garden of Eden. With the gift of intellect. They believe that with this gift of intellect, man will develop technology. And with that technology, man himself will become God. They worship the intellect, and they are, in fact, and you don't need to go to any Bible or any church to understand this, they are, in fact, the purest form of Satanism from a religious point of view. From a secular or a worldly point of view, they are men who do not believe in God or in God's or in Christ, or in Muhammad, or in Buddha, or Confucius, or anyone else. They believe in the intellect. They believe in man. They are humanist. And they believe that with the use of technology, man will become immortal and will himself become God. Remember, I said, don't take this literally. Remember, I'm not a preacher and I'm not preaching to you. These are facts that I learned while I was a member of this organization, or one of these organizations, years ago. And reinforced while I was a member of the Office of Naval Intelligence. And backed up by over 20 years of research. It doesn't sound good. Nobody wants to believe it. But Franklin Delano Roosevelt said once, nothing happens by accident. Everything is planned. And let me ask you this, ladies and gentlemen, if you had the power, the influence, the money, and the means, would you do everything that you possibly could to make the future what you would like it to be? I asked myself that question and I had to say yes. So what makes you think these men are any different? They're doing exactly what we would do if we could be in their shoes. They have the organization, the influence, the power, the money, and the means. And they're bringing about a future world in which the unintelligent masses are the masses who will not use their intelligence, whichever you choose to believe, can be brought under complete 
control on a 24-hour daily basis, and I mean complete control, so that they can never be a danger to the ruling elite ever again. In this new world, there will be no more wars. It's true, there will be no more wars. There will be no cash, so most crime will disappear. Drugs will be legalized because addiction to drugs or cigarettes or anything else is a form of euphemistic slavery. And the slave can be controlled merely by fluctuating or controlling the supply of whatever they're addicted to and the price. It's easy. It also brings in vast amounts of money for the rulers. And right now, it's functioning as a way to scare the hell out of the middle class so that they beg for more control. Bet you never thought of that, did you? Because it's not Colombian drug lords who are bringing all the drugs into this country. And if you sat down and you really use your brain and think about it, you'll be able to figure out exactly who's doing it. And I'll tell you exactly who's doing it. But that's another night. That's not tonight. Also, think very seriously about the ozone layer, folks. Remember the rainforest? Think about the ozone layer. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there isn't any. Never was, never will be. You see, a molecule of ozone, from the time it's created, lasts only about six seconds. It doesn't have time to seek a layer and layer out. Not only that, but the atmosphere is constantly moving. It's being shifted by winds and low-pressure centers and high-pressure centers and jet streams and storms and clouds. It never stays still long enough, ladies and gentlemen, for any gases to layer. But if it did, let me assure you that the heaviest gases would always layer first. And the heaviest gas in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. If you can stand on the surface of the earth at sea level and breathe and live, then you know that no such layering has ever taken place. In fact, if layering did take place, you would only be able to breathe and live in the oxygen layer. And you'd have to seek that out according to the atomic weight of the various gases in the atmosphere. How do I know this? I used to be the head of the mixed gas deep saturation diving department of the College of Oceaneering. I am an expert on gases. That college, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is the world premier diving college in civilian land. And being as the military has no deep saturation capabilities, such as the civilian industries do, it is the premier diving college in the world, bar none. So I know what I'm talking about. And for anyone who doubts what I'm saying, I can prove it to you very easily, if I have to. But you'll have to fly here for me to do it, and I'm not going to pay your expenses. But if you insist, I will, in fact, prove it to you. You could prove it to yourself in any high school physics or chemistry laboratory, if you just use your head. But what does the ozone layer do, ladies and gentlemen? I'll tell you what it does. It screams for control. More control. One world government because somebody has to dictate control over the atmosphere. Requires the destruction of sovereignty of nations. They're building a case on a scale that you cannot even imagine. Because there are yet more and more and more manipulations that I haven't even talked about yet. All making you ask for more control. Think about it. And wake up. Wake up. Wake up. And echo this. 
throughout the land. You must wake up. It is absolutely necessary for your survival, for your freedom, for your future, for your children. We together can make the world what we want it to be, and we can make it the most beautiful, wonderful world you can imagine within the limits of the frailty and the imperfections of the human race. Or we can let someone else dictate our future, and we can be their slaves. Good night, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless you all. Thank you.